Last year, we took the kids on a fun vacation. We had been planning for over a year and a half to go to Legoland, Florida. And this was something that, you know, both of the kids love Lego. And yeah, Lego is the, is the correct plural, so I know it sounds incorrect, but uh, so they, they love playing with Lego, and, and if I'm honest, I don't hate it either. But uh, so this was something that when we, we were trying to keep it initially, keep it quiet, because we didn't want them to, to not sleep through the night, you know, for eight months, because they were so excited about going. Uh, but that didn't, we weren't able to keep that secret very long. And, but it's so funny that, that both of them were so excited that they couldn't help but tell everyone. Regardless of the context, regardless of it made sense or not, Kinsley especially, she told her hairdressers, she told her teachers, she told anybody and everybody, regardless if they cared, but about her upcoming trip to Legoland and, and after going, continued to talk about it. But as, as, a, as a father, it was fun to see her, to see them get so excited about something that they can't even contain it and have to tell other people about it. And I have to stop and wonder if how that connects to God's perspective as our Heavenly Father, as He looks down and He's given us this exciting, urgent message to share with the dying world. And what it does to the heart of the Father when we are so excited about it and on that mission that it's overflowing from us, it's pouring out of our lives. We can't wait to share it. Or what does it do to the heart of the Father when He's given us this dire, urgent message to share? And we're indifferent or apathetic. Or, was, ah, that's, that's the pastor's job, right? That's not, that's not my call. I'm not, I'm not a speaker. I'm not a teacher. Or, uh, that, that's for the vocational pastor. It's for the guy up on the stage or on the television. But what does it do to the heart of God the Father to see the difference of his children who are so overwhelmed with excitement and urgency versus the apathy and indifference in that call that he's given us? You know, in this sermon series that we're going through, that we're concluding today, ours, we're looking at the missional pursuit of Jesus to reach out to the lost, the sinner, the outcast, that we, we've looked thus far at four different parables or four different stories that Jesus has told and that he often taught through these parables, through these stories. And they're hypothetical stories that illustrate a real truth. And this morning, we're going to, in closing out the sermon series, we're going to be looking at the parable of the sower. And this is a familiar parable, so you very likely know it or have heard of it uh, multiple times. Even if you've never actually read it yourself, you likely have a level of familiarity of, with the story. But Jesus tells this story, again, it's a hypothetical story of this farmer that goes out in the field and casts his seed all around him on various soils. And it lands on, Jesus describes, four different types of soils that first it lands, some of it lands on this path, on this road that the seed is trampled on. And then it's, it's eaten up and taken away by birds. And then other seed lands on a rocky soil. And while it starts to make its way into the soil above the rocks, and it even initially starts to sprout, but then it quickly withers and dies. And then yet another seed falls on, falls on thorns, 
And I also, again, it starts to sprout up and grow with the thorns, but then the thorns choke it out. And eventually it also withers and dies. But then lastly, fourthly, that some of the seed that the farmer scatters falls on good soil. And that seed grows roots and grows up and actually produces fruit. And so Jesus tells this story and his disciples, uh, which we often see, they're a little confused and they have questions and they ask, what does this mean? Why are you telling us this story? And so Jesus responds to this question. In Luke 8, starting in verse 11, he says, This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts, so they may not believe and be saved. And so Jesus explains that the seed in this story represents the word of God, represents God's truth, and that the farmer is, is scattering and sharing the word of God. And so it's clear at the outset here, if it wasn't already, that Jesus is not really talking about farming. He's not really talking about how to best grow crops or get the most out of your production, the most out of your time. He's talking about something else. And he says that, so this farmer goes out and shares the word of God with all of these people. And the devil seeks to, seeks to hinder people from responding or seeks to, uh, to prevent the, that seed from, from actually growing and taking up root. But notice here that this, uh, this soil on, on the road, on the path, that it actually, it actually comes into contact with the seed. He says the person actually hears the message. It's not that they didn't hear it. It's that they didn't allow, they didn't allow the message to actually sink in and, and actually develop a root system deep within them. They just weren't open to it. So the, the message came to them, they heard it, but then they did not allow it to actually sink in and, and make any sort of change in them. So that's the first type of soil, the first type of person that Jesus refers to that the, the farmer has shared the message with. And then Jesus talks about the, the rocky soil, verse 13. So those seed that fell on the, on the rock are the ones that receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in, time, in the time of testing, they fall away. And so it's, it's not that you know, we, we hear that it fell on the rock and we think of it just being a rock, but actually the picture painted is that there are rocks in the soil and that there is a thin layer of soil over the rocks and that the seed does start to make its way into that soil. So they, this person hears the message and initially they respond with joy, they respond with excitement. And it actually, because that seed doesn't actually get to get very deep into that soil. It doesn't uh, take long for it to sprout, but then it quickly dies because it doesn't have a root system that has been able to mature, to grow, for it to be able to uh, endure the storms that, that challenge it. So it sprouts up quickly and then it quickly dies. 
And then Jesus goes on to describe the third type of soil and says, The seed that fell among the thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked out by life's worries, by life's riches and pleasures, and they do not mature. So again, this person also hears the message and initially seems to respond and, and receive the message. It actually makes its way down into the soil and starts to grow up. However, it allows the, the thorns around it to choke it out. And that these people, they are overtaken by the difficulties, the challenges, life's worries, anxiety, stress, temptation, by the desires, the pleasures, as, as Jesus says. Uh, and that, so this also, initially that seed goes beneath the surface and starts to grow. But it is never actually allowed to. The soil doesn't actually let that message get deep enough to grow a strong, mature foundation that will withstand it through the, the, all of that, all that, the challenges that it will face that will try to, to choke it out. And then Jesus goes on to talk about the fourth and final soil. He says, but the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word and retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. And so this, you know, Jesus here has gone through four different types of, of soils, four different types of people who actually hear the same message. Notice it's the same seed that all four receive. It's the same farmer who threw out the seed that landed on each of the four. So the only change, the only difference is the condition of the soil. That one had rocks and had obstacles, had, wouldn't let that seed go any deeper to develop the roots. Others weren't willing to get rid of the thorns and the things that competed with them would choke out that message, that truth in their life. And the others that just weren't open whatsoever to that message. And then lastly, the one that actually allows the truth of God's word to sink so deep within them that it actually grows a root system that is deep enough and strong enough to, with, to withstand Again, the, the dry seasons, the be able to draw water from the, the subsoil deep down beneath that top level uh, layer of, uh, of soil. So Jesus is describing the heart, the condition of the heart of these different people who hear the same message. And in doing so, of these four, there's only one that allows it to sink deep enough to, uh, to allow it to grow, strong roots to sustain it, as we've said. Notice here that this is, again, the only soil that actually perseveres through, life, through the, the, the things that threaten its life. And that it is through persevering, by persevering, as Jesus says, that that Actually, that crop actually bears fruit or produces crops. Have you experienced that in your life, that, that in clinging to that faith, clinging to God's word, and in persevering through difficulties that you find yourself going through, that you learn and you grow and you produce fruit in your life that you may never have thought you were capable of. And God uses you in ways that, that surprise you. When you think about producing fruit, it's, it, it is evident to those around you 
and it blesses others. See, a lot of times people think about their response to the gospel. They think about the gospel as it, it, it benefits, it's to benefit me, it's to save me, but then it's only for me without realizing that the gospel message is not just for me. It's not just for you, but God has called us to actually be on his mission with him, living in such a way that we are bearing fruit that benefits those around us, that challenges them, that shines God's light in their lives. And that when we see that and start to recognize that, we start to see and understand that the gospel message is not just about benefiting me. But I need to be a conduit through which God will shine his light. And he will, will shine through me and bless those and challenge those around me. And so you you might be asking this morning, well, what in the world does this parable have to do with this sermon series we've been going through? We've been talking about this pursuit of Jesus, this missional pursuit as he's going out and and, um, so persistently, urgently pursuing the lost, the outcast, the sinner, those who who are far off, who the Pharisees have ignored, the teachers of the law have ignored and have judged and refused to share the truth with because they're more worried about protecting themselves than about going out and having an impact for the kingdom of God. So how does this parable connect with that? Well, when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we're not just committing to be saved, But we are committing ourselves to his mission, to his pursuit, to say, I will join it. I will be a part of it. I will be more than just a beneficiary of the gospel. But I will also be a conduit through which it will be spoken. It will be shined through my lifestyle. That by committing to follow Jesus, we are committing to be on this mission with him. On this pursuit of the lost with him. And so while, yes, this parable is, is, is largely centered on the condition of these soils and their receptivity to the gospel message that they encounter, but also as, as a Christ follower, I also have to read this in light of the farmer as well, because I start to see and realize that in receiving Jesus in my life also requires me to be more than soil. That I also need to be the farmer relentlessly casting out, scattering the seed of the gospel everywhere that I have access to. In, in reading this parable and thinking of it in terms of the farmer, you might stop and say, well, this farmer is a terrible farmer. Why is he just th- carelessly throwing seeds everywhere? Does it, he's not being very, very efficient. He's just wasting all of his seeds. Why, why would you throw them on the thorns? Why would you throw them on the rocky soil or on the path that's infested by hungry birds and animals and people travel on that road all the time? Why why is he wasting his seed? Why is he wasting his time? Why is he wasting his efforts? But one of the striking things about this story is the farmer has no concern whatsoever about conserving the seed. He has no concern whatsoever about wasting his time or his efforts on the soils that will reject the message. Rather, he is so consumed with the urgency of this message that he is scattering it indiscriminately without concern with where it is falling because of the urgency of 
the, the gospel that people are dying all around, desperately in need of this truth. And so we can tend to try to be soil inspectors, to try to be so, so strategic. I don't want to waste my time or my effort. This, this guy's not interested in the gospel. Maybe I've already tried to share with them before, and they said no, they weren't interested. I've already invited them to church in the past. Oh, you should hear the way this person talks or see the way that they live. They're not interested in, in, in this Jesus stuff. They're never going to read the Bible. We can get so caught up in trying to be so clever and strategic and conserve, uh, conserving of our energy that we're not going to waste our time spreading seeds on the path or on the rocks or on the thorns. But we are not called to be soil inspectors. We're not called to take a soil sample and take it back to the lab and, and wait for the results before I waste my time talking about Jesus with this person or pursuing a relationship with them in order to be able to have an influence in their life for the gospel, for the kingdom. We're called to be so passionate and on this mission that Jesus didn't just commission us to do. He exemplified it. He went out and lived it. He said, do what I do. We're called to be so on fire for that, that we don't have time to bother about, is, there, is this person going to receive it or not? It's not your job for them to receive it. We can try to feel like, well, it's on us to make it grow. It is not your responsibility to make it grow. It is our responsibility to be faithful and obedient in indiscriminately Casting the seeds every direction that we possibly can, regardless of where it lands. And you could say, well, I, I just want this person to receive it. I want this person. And yes, that's great. Cast seeds on them every day. You know, um, bathe them with, douse them in water to help them grow. Absolutely, that's great. Pray for them. Live out the example for them to see. Share in word. All of that is great, but ultimately it is their decision what they do with that. You're not responsible to make it grow. Cast the seed. You can water it, but then trust that God will shine his light and that he will do his work. I have seen people who I have prayed for for years who have expressed zero interest or openness in having conversations about God and seen them go up to the altar and accept Jesus. One of whom was in my family, and I had no idea that God was moving in her heart that he was tilling up the soil in the background. I had no idea that he was moving and working behind the scenes. But God is able to do that. God is the God who can work and move, and that doesn't need me to do it. He's called me to do it. I need to be obedient and faithful, but you know what? He also brought other people around this person and influenced and shined his light and then we can just trust God and say, God, I will do everything I can do to communicate your word and your truth. But ultimately, it is up to you. You are the only one who can soften their heart, and then it is their decision on whether or not they respond by allowing this seed of the gospel message to permeate through, to go all the way to the core of their heart so much so that it can't help but produce fruit and grow and spill out from their life. We're not called to be collectors of the seed, to store our warehouse and be so careful with what we do with it, but to passionately, urgently scatter it everywhere that we can. 
we're also not called to just be, to come together as a holy huddle of farmers and say, okay, this is our, our, our special country club that, you know, that's for the farmers to come together and, and, and get together. And if other people come and they just so happen to hear us, then okay, they can come. No, when we come together on a Sunday morning, this is one of the, the, best, the best opportunities for you to bring people in, to hear the gospel message, to meet other people who know Jesus and love Jesus, to be loved on, to have an example lived out. This is an, an, this is an incredible opportunity for people to uh, be exposed to the gospel message, to receive that seed or have it be watered. And that this Sunday morning service and our ministries here through the church they can't just be for the farmers. They can't just be for the Christ followers, but we have to be more focused on welcoming people in, making them feel welcome, inviting them, loving them, regardless of if, they, if their so, the soil of their heart is closer to the road or the thorns or the rocks or the good soil. And that we need to be a people that is intentionally focused on and committed to reaching outward. If this church is not committed to reaching the lost, if we are not on that pursuit, if, if this is just a country club for Christ followers to come and high five and say, yes, we're saved, and that's it. This church will die. If, we're, if we refuse to live the great commission that God has called us to, this church should die. Because God has called us to not sit idly, to not be indifferent but to actually pursue what breaks his heart that he has called us to love, to lovingly run after the, the lost, welcome them in. I want to give a couple of, I want to give a couple of practical examples of ways that we can, that we can do this. And, I, you may be tired of me working this scripture into, into my messages, but it's just so, it has to be so fundamental to why we're here and what we do. The, the, the Great Commission, that Jesus, Matthew records the very last two verses of his gospel message is this final commission of Jesus to therefore go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you, and behold, and behold, I'll be with you to the very end of the age. And so that this is what we've been called to do and commissioned to do. It's why we're here. We have to be focused on and committed to reaching out. So I want to give you a couple of practical ways that we can do that. For one, I've already referenced the power of inviting people here in order to hear the message, to meet other Christ followers, to benefit from the ministries, maybe the God's Closet ministry, the library that we have in our, in our lobby that's open to anyone. I'd love to see that used more. Uh, what, what, what regard, this service, and the fellowship time beforehand, the Sunday school that Danielle teaches beforehand, uh, just great opportunities to expose people to that. And, uh, but you can't you can't invite people in if you are not faithfully attending yourself. And, and also along with that too, that if, if you invite someone here, it makes a difference if other people are faithfully attending. For them to be able to meet and influence and make friends with and welcome that guest here. It makes a difference when we are here together 
Does it make a difference when there are people worshiping around you versus being the only one singing there in that row? Does it make a difference to have other people praying for the same requests? It makes a difference when we actually make this important enough and a priority enough to come week after week and to not just come, but to come with this outward focused mission mindset that I'm going to be here and look for ways to pour into other people and look for ways for these hands to be used for the kingdom of God. We can't do that if we're not here. We can't do that if we're not intentional about looking for and praying for those opportunities. It can't just be the pastor's job. Also, another practical thing I want to give you is to pour into and seek and pray over what is it that What is it that you believe to to know what that is? And that Peter says um, in 1 Peter 3.15 in his his letter, he says that always be ready and prepared to give a reason for the hope that's within you. To be prepared. This, This past sermon series we went through, it was 15 weeks of what we believe rooted in God's word why it matters, how it applies in our life. And so it's a great resource to go back to in building up a a, a rational, rational, reasonable, effective way of sharing what you believe and, again, why it matters. Also, in terms of practical things that we can do, and I'm going to close with this, is is continually praying for God to open your eyes, to open your ears, to open your heart to seeing opportunities around you, to be a witness, to make a difference and an impact for the kingdom of God. That we can get so caught up in in our busyness, in our stress, in all the things that are going on, that we can be blinded to the soil around us that desperately needs the seeds that we have to give. And praying that God would open our eyes to those opportunities and that God would break our hearts for the lost enough to actually put us into action to do something about it. That is what God has called us to. And so in this series, we've looked at Jesus's missional pursuit and this morning I want to close that series by calling us to be in that mission with him not just here on Sundays but in our everyday lives would you bow with me as we pray Lord we come before you God we thank you for pursuing us first we are here because you lovingly pursued us Regardless of of where the people who are in this room or watching the live stream or on YouTube afterwards, regardless of where we're currently at in our walk with you, of where that seed is at in our heart, Lord, that you have brought us here for a reason today. Would you open us up? Let your word sink deeper. Grow greater roots in our lives. And would you... Produce fruit in us and through us, Lord, in order to grow your kingdom, to reach the lost. Would you break our hearts, Lord, for the lost? Align our hearts with yours. We want to be faithful and obedient. We want to see you move in and through our lives. We love you, Lord. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.